Hmm. Uh oh. Hey, what's up, Wheelies and Dark Friends? Mike back again to talk a little wheel. What wheel? The wheel. The wheel of time guys this is a series that there are many many things to talk about and i've talked about them at length on this channel multiple multiple times but this week's going to be a little different and maybe somewhat dangerous now i want to say up front guys this is going to be 100 percent spoiler free i've had a lot of people lately tell me oh well, i'll watch that after i've read it guys this will maybe encourage you or discourage you to read the wheel of time so you don't have to know anything about the wheel of time to watch this video and i hope you'll stick around and check it out because there are lots of things i think that we should talk about because i get a lot of questions a lot of time is wheel of time worth it you know i did the uh this kind of setup for lycanius a while back because i had a lot of people interested in that series one way or the other so with the good and the bad series i want to say up front with the good and the bad series that i'm doing here i want you guys to understand that these aren't necessarily series that i don't like and a lot of times are series that i love i've got planned to do many series that i love in the good and the bad because you know why there are plenty of flaws in just about everything out there and it's okay to talk about them it doesn't mean you don't like them it just creates discussion and i think when you got something as beloved as Wheel of Time, you'll get some people to be kind of overprotective and they'll think that, oh, well, you're just being a hater or something like that. Look, guys, I love the Wheel of Time. Love it. Okay. I've got all 15 on hardcover back there, including the uh, the Wheel of Time Companion on hardcover. Uh, 13 or hang on. 11 of them are first editions that I paid out the nose for. I've got a printout of the actual Wheel of Time logo above the shelf there. I don't do that for series that I don't like. There are criticisms I have for everything in Wheel of Time is one of them. And again, I think this will help people out that are kind of on the edge with reading it or not. I already did my why you should read the Wheel of Time. So this is going to kind of be the other side of that. So I want to get that up front because I know a lot of people really, really get upset when I talk uh, anything that they might consider negative about Wheel of Time. But just know there's going to be a lot of positive in this video as well. So 1990 to 2013 took for this series to be completed. Took two authors because the original passed away, unfortunately, before he was able to finish. And then Brandon Sanderson began his ascent to stardom. Not really beginning with Wheel of Time, but I think this is where he, uh, his name became a household name to just about everybody due to the popularity of of this series and what is ironic about this video is it is two years to the day guys the two-year anniversary of when i first picked up eye of the world and started this journey right before i started this channel so with the time will always be dear to me for that reason alone uh, it introduced me to not only a great fantasy world but a lot of great people that i've met along the way here and it made me realize that booktube is actually a thing that i did not know about and i'm very very happy that it is now look i've reviewed every book on this channel you can find those and many other Wheel of Time content right here. Uh, I talk about the TV show. I talk about just, uh, you know, how I would do stuff, tier list, anything you can think of with Wheel of Time, I've probably done it. And I'm going to keep doing stuff more and more as this TV series gets closer. So again, guys, I love the Wheel of Time, but I feel like it is ripe for this program, the good and the bad. So let's go ahead and kick it off here with the good. This might be the richest fantasy world outside of Mr. Tolkien. And that is a compliment in every measure. Tolkien is my guy, right? So the fact that I can put Robert Jordan kind of like in the same seat with Mr. Tolkien, that is absolutely the highest compliment that I can give anyone. This world, this world building, it's second to none. It's so rich and full of history. And I love that you can really just differentiate the different nations, the different kingdoms, the different cultures and you know exactly what those differences are. Uh, you have a lot of words in this and you think, Oh yeah, sure, you can know it by that point, but he's so good at it. The, the, the Robert Jordan's pen is absolutely amazing, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But again, I just love this world that he made. Even though he never really gives it an official 
name. It's just kind of come to be known as Randland over the years. Again, they someone could say, oh, well, they were Shinaran. You know exactly where that is. You know exactly what they look like. You know their defining characteristics. You know what their wardrobe is because he's so good at designing those things. And yeah, it, you can't really say much more about that than he's just a master world crafter. And it really is on display, especially those first six or so books where he really, really is just continuing to expand this land. Then I got to talk about the characters. Uh, I think these characters are so special that they'll basically be friends and family for you by the end. You feel like they are a real person that you could text on your phone and be like, what are you doing? I really do feel that real because, I mean, not the phone part, but you know what I mean. They're, they feel really close to you and you feel like you know them to a point that where you're reading it, you're like talking out loud to them. Oh man, parent, what are you doing? Oh, hey, hey Matt, that's exactly what I would do. Things like that. It was things that you could really relate to them, even though it is a very fantastical world. You know, nothing really much like our world at all. But again, you feel like you know them. And I think one of the big ones here, and this might be a sensitive topic, but I got to talk about it. I feel like there's equal gender representation. There's a lot of traditional fantasy at the time. Yes, even as recently as the 1990s, it was very, very male dominated. And in, in a way to where women are just, you know, simpering princesses. They really, really feel like this. Now, I don't think Tolkien falls in that because if you read that book and you don't think that Eowyn is a badass, I don't know what book you read, right? So, uh, but there is a lot of traditional fantasy where women are just an object to be saved. And I understand that that is a problem with a lot of traditional fantasy. I haven't actually done the count, but I'm willing to bet if you line it up, you, you might actually have more women in this book than you have men. And again, they have important roles. And in this world, uh, that matters. I have to bring this up because usually I wouldn't bring something up like this, but gender is super, super big deal in this book because of the way that the magic system works. And that leads me to the magic system, what I think is one of the gold standards of a magic system in a fantasy world, the, the true power, the one power, all these things. So, so good. And it's really explained quite well to where you feel like you know exactly what's going on at all times. Even if you have some questions a little earlier on, like, hey, what the hell does Bellfire do? He'll explain it to you and it'll make sense. And I don't think it's quite like a complex. And when I say it's the gold standard, I don't mean it's the best, okay? It's just, it's what a lot of other things, like you read like Canius and be like, yeah, I can see you. I feel like, I feel like I've read this magic system before. You can see things like that. But I'm not saying, oh, well, this is kind of like what Brandon Sanderson. Now, Brandon Sanderson's in a league of his own when it comes to magic systems, but I see a lot of fantasy basically use this as their roadmap. Let's talk about that T word, guys. The T word is tropes. Yes, this book is full of them. Farm boy leaves home, the big, bad, dark, evil, uh, the uh, the whole Camp Hellion journey. They're done right. They're done very, very well. Now look, guys, one of the reasons I love this genre is because I love those tropes, right? It's when people try to do those tropes and act like they're reinventing the wheel and get offended if anybody brings up, hey, this is kind of like with this, 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 this. If you, if you admit that it's an influence to you, I got no problem if you use those things, as long as it's not like blatant copying, you know? But I, again, I feel like these tropes are all done really, really well. You know, someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, by the way, you're supposed to save the world. It's, it's something that's been done millions of times, but it's done to perfection, I think, in here with the farm boy, leaves home, Campbellian journey, all of those things. Uh, something I think that really that Robert Jordan doesn't get enough credit for is he writes incredible action sequences. You know, people talk about his world building and his descriptions and things like that. And while I do have some problems with some of his sword fights later in the series, uh, when he's des describing magic being used, second to none. When he's describing like huge field battles, second to none. It's fantastic stuff. It really is just, you know, cinematic. You can see it in your head. It's just humongous. The powers, the, the power levels in this and just seeing some of these, uh, these wars and these conflicts and uh, being a war veteran, you can see that he wrote some of that kind of stuff into this story and it's very, very well. And I got to talk about his writing style here. Uh, I, I get a lot of things about prose this and prose that. Look, I am definitely not a pro snob. I'm not a pros expert. All I'll say is Robert Jordan, I could have handed him this mug and he could have described everything about it to me in about 3,000 words and it never would have lacked for any importance. It really, he gets a lot of flack about writing fluffy kind of stuff. Uh, no, no. When it comes to like describing a situation or an object or the history of something, fantastic stuff. And it wasn't a Wheel of Time mug by accident. Uh, but uh, yeah, another thing about this, guys, 
Your age does not matter. You could be a preteen, you could be a senior citizen, you're gonna find someone in this book to relate to. It really is one of those where it is welcoming to all, just like a Lord of the Rings and where anyone could read this. It might be a little complex for really, really young readers. I, I wouldn't say jump from The Hobbit to this because just of the sheer amount of characters and things like that. But I, I do think that it is very approachable for just about any demographic, male, female. It does not matter. Ethnicity does not matter. You're going to find something that's for you in this book. And that's mostly because the universe is just so large and there are so many characters and things like that in here and so many storylines. I think you'll find something for everyone. Big thing that you'll hear from Wheel of Time fans when you first start reading is, oh, it's even better on a reread. Now, look, I'll never reread the series, most likely, because I've got you guys see that, about a third of that stuff out there I haven't read yet, and I'm not exactly like you know 20 anymore. I doubt I'll be able to finish everything I want to read before I move on to the next life. But here's the thing: I think it is absolutely a series that is right for a reread because when you finish it, you look back on some of these prophecies that Mr. Jordan lays out, and you're like, "Holy crap!" As early as book one. Some of those prophecies were right there in front of our face and we could never see it. So I think it's one of those things in a reread. Yeah, you're going to see that foreshadowing so, so well. And it's going to make it a better experience for you. For me, if I had discovered this series when I was younger and read it as it was being released, yeah, I would have loved to have done a reread. But at this point in life, I don't have time for 15 tomes uh, again. But another good reason is there is a TV series coming out, in case you guys don't know, very, very soon. And I think that uh, a nice reread of these books, if you haven't read them in quite a while, before that series comes out would be really great. Or if you just want to read for the first time, for that's how this started for me, guys. I always told a friend that, hey, if they ever make an adaptation of this, I'll read it. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to read enough to stay ahead of the show. I read the whole series about a year before the show came out, at least. <laughs> you know, So uh, it's kind of addictive that way. You'll find yourself uh, really, really going on and on about it. Uh, I, I think that sometimes the misconception about this is you'll hear people say, well, I tried reading it, but I felt like it was just very derivative of Lord of the Rings. Now, look, I of the world, I'm not going to lie. I, I feel like there are so many comparisons to Fellowship of the Ring in it. You can definitely feel like that. Starting with about the one-third mark in The Great Hunt, that's book number two, he takes such a hard left turn that your neck will snap, and it is nothing like Lord of the Rings after that. It is 100% its own thing. So um, I, if you're thinking this is going to be like a Shannara deal, I don't think that that's exactly what's going to happen here, even though I know Shannara did change too, guys. I, uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, I think that you will find it is very much not like Tolkien. It is very, very its own thing. And it's very much a unique thing. And it is a thing that many other series have copied this outside of him copying Tolkien. Again, guys, I think in the 19... Even as early... Or as late as the 1990s, if you weren't writing like Tolkien, you weren't getting published in fantasy. So he had to do that to get published, and then he took a risk, and what do you know? A phenomenon was born. So uh, again, I don't fault him for that. Uh, another thing about this is I think that the fandom, I got to talk about the fandom. I feel like they're very, very helpful. Uh, they don't like to spoil anything for anybody because they love seeing first-time readers. They, they really do like to uh, see them experience this for the first time, see what people are thinking, and then, you know, give a nice little, ha, oh, you sweet summer child, that's a cute theory you got, things like that, but never in a, a demeaning way. Very, very friendly, very, very nice. Like I said, a ton of the people that I still talk to constantly on this, show, this channel that post in the comments came along while I was doing my first reading of The Wheel of Time. So very, very nice and approachable fandom. They're welcoming to everybody. And uh, I, I think that you'll, uh, you'll find a nice support system there if that's something that you're looking for. And in the end, guys, I just feel like this is a journey very much worth taking. Yo, it's not short. It's not something if you're like, oh, I just want to get through something real fast. No, you got to accept you're going to be reading this for like a year, you know, at least. I know other people read these way faster than I did. Uh, I did, what, 14 months? So, um, you know, hey, sometimes real life gets in the way. And I, I started running a booktube channel, and I realized I, wanna, I don't want to just become another Wheel of Time channel, so I need to read other stuff in between that. So that's why I did it the format that I did. But I think it's very much a series that you could binge if that's something that you were into. But uh, again, uh, to me, a journey like this, much like I'm doing with Malazan, take your time. I think that you'll enjoy it better if you just take your time. You'll catch so much more. You won't burn yourself out. And uh, you'll just you'll just have a, a good little ride with it. And I think that's a good point for me to transition into the bad. Now, look, guys, this is going to be absolutely subjective. And I'm not looking for you to tell me reasons 
why I'm wrong. Uh, I'm just trying to give people some things that maybe didn't quite work for me. And again, like I said, if this is something that you love, that's awesome, guys. It's 100% my opinion. These are things that did not work for me. Now, I think the biggest bad you're going to hear about this series if you just go on google and you type in should i read wheel of time you're going to get warnings even from the most devout fans about the slog now i've always said i feel like this is a very very bad sales pitch from wheel of time fans they want people to read this series and then they tell them oh yeah by the way books seven through ten all of them are about this thick boring as shit they tell them this they tell them this and think that people are going to want to read the series after they tell them that stop telling people that Yes, that's that's my advice. Stop telling people that. Yes, there are slow parts. There are repetitive plots. There is lost direction. There is unnecessary characters. <sighs> yes, the slog is real, but I do think it's very, very dumb to be chasing off new readers because you tell them that, uh, oh yeah, there's one section where you know 20% of the series is unreadable. I think that's a very, very bad sales pitch, and I wouldn't sell it like that. Yes, the slog is real. No, it's not series breaking. And also knowing what comes after the slog is absolutely 100% worth it. But yes, all those things I listed, those are very real things. There's a ton of stuff that I feel like, shh, scalpel, could have happened. A tight seven to eight book series of Wheel of Time could have been the undisputed champion of fantasy for me. I really think it could have even topped Lord of the Rings for me if it had just been a tight seven to eight book story because I really think he had a great idea and it just started to get away from him a little bit. And I think even he admitted that it started to get away from him a few times, you know? So uh, yes, the slog is very, very real, but again, it, it's worth it. But I, I can't sit here and tell you, no, don't worry about it. It's not a big deal because it is. It is going to be a little bit of a challenge. So uh, I, to me, I read series like this to be challenged. It might not be the kind of challenge that you're looking for, but it is a very real thing as well as there are too many Characters, guys, you're going to need an Excel spreadsheet because there are 2,782 characters in this book. Obviously, they're not all prominent. And obviously, some of them can be mentioned once. Some of them can be mentioned and go one ear out the other. And you're not going to lose anything. A big problem is that a lot of them, especially the Aes Sedai names, all sound the same. They all spelled the same. It's very, very rough to remember who is who at times. Like I said, when I first started... I was full-on Excel spreadsheet. Here's this faction. This is this character's name. Here's this. Here's that. Here's this traveling party. All that stuff. Because not only do they sound the same, they look the same. you got Egwene, Marlene, <laughs> Elaine. You know, All these characters start to sound the same after a while. And at first, it might seem like a bunch. You get used to it. But uh, when you really start dipping into some of those Aes Sedai names, especially the ones that seem to start with A or S, it just seems like there's a million of them. And you just got to accept you're not going to understand all of them. And if they're important enough, they're going to come back around again. But uh, yeah, that is very much something that might be rough for you. As well as that the fact that there's so many characters in this, there's going to be one of the primary characters that you're going to abhor. You're going to absolutely hate when it's a POV chapter from that character. Like for me, if it starts with an E and it ends with an E, it's usually pretty bad. Elaine and Egwene, very, very rough for me in this series. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. And everybody has their own uh, that they do not like, you know, and it's just going to happen when you got a cast this large, you got a story this long. Not every arc's going to work for you. Not every character uh, development's going to be a big deal to you. And some characters are going to grate on you a little bit. It happens. It happens. And sometimes I believe they were written that way to be obnoxious, to get on your nerves and things like that. So everyone's going to kind of have that. And again, there's just really nothing you can do about it when you got a cast this large. Now, to, to differentiate these characters, you had to make them all different. Again, this might seem a little controversial, but you can read any review out there for the first handful of books. There are a lot of what people considered unlikable female protagonists. They are very angry. They are always very dismissive towards men. If that's something that bothers you, it's going to be very tough for you to get on board with some of these things. But you've got to understand that this world is not a matriarchy. It is a patriarchy. So things are very, very different. And that that's fine. It's a fantastic world. I have no problems with that. But I can understand how a lot of people cannot get on board with a lot of the female characters early in the series. Because like I said, they're always just mean. They're always angry. They're always just hitting people. They're always just being insulting. They're always being demeaning and degrading of people. And it's, it, it's tough to get on board with some of them. All I'll tell you guys is keep reading. Because there's a character that I absolutely could not stand till about book seven. And by the time I ended the series, my favorite character. So again, give it a chance to breathe. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this as one of the bads in here. That is that, yeah, 
there's going to be some ladies in here that might grate on you just a little bit, regardless of if you're a man or a woman, because I've talked to a lot of female readers who say the same thing. So uh, again, I hope that that's not uh, uh, too uh, mm for you. Let's put it that way. Uh, a big one for me, and if you've watched those reviews, you know, I very much, this is probably my least favorite thing about this series. And this is my biggest negative out of the whole thing. And I want you to understand, I got what Robert Jordan was going for. It just didn't work for me. And what that is, is I don't like how he flips the roles of rape and makes it seem like it's okay because it's happening this way. Um, it feels like it's treated differently just because the genders are swapped. Uh, a male character talks about being raped and the women laugh at him. And I'm supposed to think, oh, that's okay. He deserved it because he was a womanizer. That's, no, I'm never going to get on board with that. Apparently, this is a very dismissive arc. Or, sorry, miss dismissive. A very divisive arc in this story amongst the fandom. There are some people who love it. There are some people who hate it. Uh, to me, I couldn't stand it. I hated it so much. And um, it, it's really the black eye on a book in the series that I like a lot. So uh, again, that's just me. Uh, if it didn't bother you, I, okay, whatever works for you. But to me, yeah, I, I don't think it's okay to say you have this stance on it, but then flip the genders and be like, ha, 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 ha. I, just, I, don't, I don't get that. I don't get that at all. So yeah, that's something that really, really bothered me about the series and still kind of eats away at me. And it's something I hope they avoid when they make the actual television series. Should it get that far? Another one, if you guys don't know, Big Dune guy. Big, big Dune guy. And it was impossible for me not to see the Aes Sedai and the Aiel not just be the Walmart versions of the Bene Gesserit and the Fremen from Dune. I understand that there are 100% uh, you know, influences that you have. And you can understand if you want to list those influences. But every time I brought that up in a review, people would be like, oh, no, Robert George said he was not... Uh, inspired by, by by Frank Herbert's Dune at all. Okay, well then I guess you believe that Suzanne Collins never read Battle Royale or The Long Walk by Stephen King before she read The Hunger Games, right? I mean, it's okay to have influences. I mean, what person from Robert Jordan's generation did not read Dune growing up? You know, it's okay if you were influenced by that. Now, I don't know the full story. I didn't know Robert Jordan personally. And, and, and I don't care. If he was influenced by it, that's fine. I have no problems with that. But to me, like I said, all I kept seeing was like, ah, oh, well, I, I kind of like the Benny Jess that did this better. Uh, I like the, uh, I think that the Fremen kind of, that, that storyline kind of did better here. And again, they're two different series. It doesn't really matter in the end. I'm just saying, as someone that is a very, very big fan of Dune, I had a hard time not seeing those things. So it was a big, big negative for me, as was some themes that are just very, very strange. Um, spanking, uh, braid tugging, the folding of arms under breasts. These are things that get brought up so much. Look, if you have a tick and you have to tug your breast, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I actually actually kind of became endeared to it after a certain point. Okay, it, it really didn't bother me. Uh, folding of arms under the breast. I understand. <laughs> Robert Jordan's a great writer. I don't know why he couldn't find different ways to describe that after about the four millionth time he used it. But again, it didn't really bother me. But uh, the spanking is just so weird to me. Um, it, it, it was kind of something I could kind of shrug off. And then there's one point in the series where there's like a super powerful character and they're trying to get information and they basically just bend them over the knee and spank them. And then they get everything they want. And I'm just like, I can't take that seriously. I'm sorry. So I don't know what that deal was about at all. But yeah, that's something that bothers me every bit as much as baths and tea times and dress descriptions and things like that. These are things that are going to be like, why is this here, Robert? Can we get on with the story? So these are things that are going to bother you quite a bit, I think. And something that might be kind of an unpopular opinion here is the villains. I think this series lacks for good villains, like totally. Every time he had one that I thought was good, he either Cobra commanded them, as in like, hey, every time they met up, the good guy won, or they just were hilarious, and not in a good way, like like in a Three Stooges kind of way. I, I constantly mentioned that I felt like the villains in this were the type who would slip on a banana peel, and it was hard for me to take those characters seriously. And I always get the same explanation. That's going to be my next uh, next point here. I don't like explaining away everything with, oh, well, it's Tavirin. To me, that's an excuse. That's an excuse just like Star Wars fans. I've been guilty of this. Well, how did Anakin know to do this or this or that? How, how did Jason Solo know how to do this, this or this? Oh, well, he just used the Force. Same deal here. Anytime 
anything goes the way that it should for our protagonist, we always hear, oh, well, it's Tavirin. And it's just like, okay. You know, I, I feel like it's just a plot device at that point that just it doesn't really work for me. So uh, once in a while, sure. Every time, nah, nah, not so much. So that's uh, really mostly... There is one more thing I kind of want to talk about. It's going to kind of seem funny because it's in both the good and the bad. And the last thing I'm going to mention here is the fandom. They can be kind of gatekeeper-y sometimes. Yes, they love seeing new people read the story. Yes, they love sharing in these experiences and having the uh, recollection of what it was like for them reading it their first time. Uh, they can also get quite vile once you have any criticisms on it or if you have a different opinion on them. Uh, when I got to, I think, Knife of Dreams, that's when a lot of my constant Wheel of Time watchers really, really turned on me because of my opinions about one character. And uh, again, I have no problems disagreeing. I think other people will, but it, it's like the accusations and things like that that you get or, or you know, maybe you just didn't understand. I, I got that a lot in a lot of my reviews is, I don't think you understood this part. You know, I understood it. Maybe I just didn't look at it the same way that you did. I don't think these books are hard to understand, guys. This isn't Malazan. This isn't Malazan where you're going to be like, I have no idea what's going on. I feel like you always know what's going on in the story. You just might look at it differently than someone else will. And I understand that a lot of people have been reading this since 1990. You know, they grew up with it. You know, they're very protective of it like that. But I won't lie, there are some fans that every, ser every series has this, guys. Every series has the fans that can be kind of gatekeeper and tell you why you're wrong and things like that. But I want to let you know that is something that is very, very real. So, guys, that was the good and the bad of the Wheel of Time for me. You might feel very, very differently, and I'm sure that you do. Uh, if you've watched this far, you haven't slammed the button to <laughs> stop yet, uh, then that, that, that that's great. I'm glad that you guys can listen to Honest Criticism. Again, this is a series I love, but have many problems with. I could do one of these for Dune, guys. It's not a big deal to me to talk about uh, criticism in a book. Constructive criticism is exactly what this is. So I hope that you guys will take it as that and drop in the comments and let me know what you really loved, what you maybe didn't love so much about the series. And I will talk to you there, Luce Theron.